Well, we have an important story to bring to you on labor issues in railroads. Joining us now to discuss are locomotive engineer and former Iowa State Representative Jeff Kurtz and editor-in-chief of The Real News Network, Max Alvarez. Thank you both for being here. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Emily. All right, Max, I'm going to start with you because you've worked on the story over at The Real News Network. Um, can you break down what folks should know about what's happening in this particular dispute? Ooh, baby. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll do my best because um, there's a whole lot here. And I guess uh, I first wanted to start by thanking you all for covering this because it's been a sorely undercovered issue. And I want to really shout out the great reporting that Mel Buer um, did at The Real News. Uh, I am kind of filling in for Mel right now um, because she is actually on assignment covering the case New Holland strike in uh, Iowa where United Auto Workers have been on strike for 70 days. So if you want a deep dive on this, go find Mel Buer's uh, report that we published last week at the Real News Network. In that report, Mel um, details how, you know, we are closer to a national rail shutdown right now than we've been in a very long time. We're talking about 115,000 workers who have been negotiating uh, uh, like they're they're part of these amalgamated unions that represent railroad workers, not just conductors and engineers, but signal callers, maintenance folks, a whole lot of people make the railroads run. And they have been negotiating with the amalgamated group that um, represents the different rail carriers for multiple years. And they have reached an impasse. Um, they actually had a government run mediation board uh, to, that stepped in and they couldn't reach uh, an agreement. And so the mediation board released both sides last month. We're now currently in a, what's called a cooling off period that actually ends on Monday. And people are waiting to see if President Joe Biden will take the step to appoint an emergency presidential board uh, to essentially step in, mediate between the railroad carriers and the railroad workers, offer recommendations. Each side has the capacity to reject those recommendations, after which point there will be another 30 day cooling off period that then clears the way for railroad workers to actually strike or railroad companies to initiate lockouts, right? And so there are a lot of steps that have to be cleared in order for a rail strike to happen in this country because rail, labor relations on the railroads are not governed by the National Labor Relations Act. They are governed by the Railway Labor, uh, by the Railway uh, 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 Labor Act, right? Which has a lot of other different um, provisions given the national security concerns and supply chain concerns that the railroads uh, entail, so on and so forth. So we are at this impasse and now people are wondering, how did we get here? Well, the thing that I would wanna stress and Jeff can, can expand on this is that this did not happen overnight. What railroad workers have been telling me over and over again is that this is a long brewing problem that you know cannot be boiled down to the sort of supply chain disruptions that we're talking about in the media, right? Everyone knows that the war in Ukraine, that COVID-19, extreme weather events exacerbated by climate change have hurt the supply chain. Of course, we all know that. But the thing that people aren't talking about is that corporate greed at the hands of the rail carriers who are raking in billions of dollars in profit has driven the supply chain into the ground because it has driven workers who make the supply chain run into the ground. That is what we need to understand here. Because right now, as the supply chain is a mess, the railroad companies are trying to say that there's a you know a labor shortage and there are these like outside forces like the war in Ukraine, yada yada yada, that they can't control for. What they're not telling you is that collectively the rail carriers have made this is a self-inflicted wound. They have created the labor crisis that they are now experiencing. Since 2015, the rail carriers have collectively eliminated 30% of their collective workforce. They've laid off 45,000 workers since 2015. And now all of this is coming to a head and we're at a real crisis point, but pe the blame should be pointed at the rail companies right now. Hmm. And, and Jeff, since this was such a long time brewing, in your mind, what demands could be met that would both equal a, a short term solution, but then also what what is the long term solution here? Well, short term, one of one of the things that really needs to be addressed is worker safety. The uh, attendance and availability policies of, of all the, the class one railroads is draconian. But uh, with the, the BNSF, they have reached new lows. 
this high vis policy. I talked to Max back in February and we talked about the, the fact that this was going to lead to physical, uh, physical and emotional problems with these uh, people that work out there as engineers and conductors because uh, 100% of their time, people are talking about uh, the BNSF high vis uh, occupying 90% of these people's time. It's more like 100%. And uh, what that does, and we, we've got the science to prove it, is it will uh, impact them as far as fatigue, which can cause a whole raft of physical problems, physical and uh, emotional problems, but also stress. You get into things like allostatic load, allostatic overload, uh, because of the extreme stress of always, always being on the point of always being available for service, going to work, or being away from home. And Jeff, I'm also curious um, as to whether the strength or lack thereof uh, of the union itself, is it strong enough to get these demands met or has it been weakened by different legislation and all of these other issues? Is that contributing, um, you know, just the struggles within the union itself, has that contributed at all to uh, the, the inability, or not the inability, but I guess the, the continuation of uh, this, this ongoing struggle to be heard by the company? Well, it's, um it's not so much the legislation as uh, our ju judicial system. Uh, originally, when the high biz policy came out, uh, the BLET and Smart TD had uh, uh, polled their members and were ready to strike. Uh, the BNSF took the uh, two unions to court and they got a, a ruling that uh, you would have to see to believe. But essentially what it said is these guys would have to stay working. They couldn't participate in anything like informational pickets. Uh, and uh, the, the company unilaterally can, could uh, uh, institute this policy in violation of the 2008 uh, Rail Safety Improvement Act. Um, so on, on one hand, you've got the carriers not having to uh, follow federal uh, legislation and on the other hand, any move that the, the union made, they were going to be penalized. So this is this is not the unions being strong or weak or anything else. It's how we weaken the, the, the union position. And, and, and Max, I wanted to pick up on something you said about the the companies engaging in thousands of layoffs over the years and then whining about not having enough workers. So today, I'm curious, and, and maybe Jeff, if you have thoughts on this as well, are these companies actually hiring? Because a lot of times you'll have companies say that they're really <laughs> frustrated, it's so sad, they can't find workers, but they're not making much of an effort to actually bring workers in. So if you're a worker today and you and you say, you know what, I'd, I'd love a union job on a railroad. This like the, it, the hours do look tough, but this beats what I'm doing now. Uh, I want to, I'm going to apply. If those people apply, are there actually a lot of openings that they're hiring for? Or is this kind of smoke and mirrors to just try to squeeze more out of the workforce that they have? It's a great question. I think like it's uh, in large part smoke and mirrors, but even it's, it's not even um, kind of smoke and mirrors. It's just like you can post, uh, you know, that you're hiring for these jobs. But the fact of the matter is, and I've talked to Jeff Kurtz about this uh, on The Real News, I've talked to Ron Kamenko from Railroad Workers United about this on The Real News as well. The thing that people need to understand is that people are not hiring out on the railroads. They're not taking those jobs because they are hearing about how railroad workers are being run into the ground. They are seeing these mass layoffs. As we speak, one of the reasons that the rail carriers and the rail unions are at an impasse is because Again, like I said, there's a long brewing problem. They, the rail carriers have been trying for decades to reduce the crews that are uh, operating these mile long trains that are super heavy, super unwieldy, very dangerous you know, to operate um, because the rail companies have been piling more work onto fewer workers. Um, you know, They are trying to reduce the crews on those trains from two people to one. So imagine you are one person in charge of that whole massive vehicle. Um, and, and like if something goes wrong, you have no one else to, to 
turn to. So people who are thinking about taking jobs on the railroads are seeing the mass amount of folks who have been laid off, the mass amount of folks who are either fleeing to um, passenger service as refugees and they are foregoing, you know, the years of accrued benefits and seniority that they built up in the freight service, or they're leaving the industry altogether and they are not advising their children, their neighbors, their friends to get jobs on the railroads. Again, really highlighting that this is a self-inflicted wound by the rail carriers who are now complaining that they can't, you know, like keep their their, um, you know, uh, operations running. Um, but you know, it's because of things like this um, policy that Jeff mentioned, the the high vis attendance policy at BNSF railway that they are seeing like you know I, this isn't worth you know like me essentially being on call 24 7 railroad engineers and conductors by definition do not have a set schedule because there are delays on the rail you basically get a call in the middle of the night saying okay your train's coming now you got to get to the terminal hop on there and because of those derailments and delays and and you know shifts on the rail lines you may like be stuck out you know in a, a motel in a strip mall for uh, days, you know, like waiting just to get back home. It's a very demanding job, like you said, Ryan. It does pay well, but right now people are saying this isn't worth it. And the last thing I would say to really like underscore what what Jeff said earlier, right, is that 17,000 rail workers represented by BLET and Smart TD were prepared to strike over BNSF's draconian attendance policy uh, in Feb on February 1st. And a U.S. District Court blocked them from striking, saying that a strike would do irreparable harm to a BNSF's business. Also, BNSF is owned by um, Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway. FYI. So the judge said that it would cause irreparable harm to their business and to the supply chain. And um, thus, that was the justification for stopping workers from striking. But the judge allowed this high vis attendance policy to go into effect. And now, six months later, what workers in BNSF are saying is that because of this attendance policy, the supply chain has been irreparably harmed because workers are being run into the ground. They're quitting in record numbers. Trains are laying idle, all while BNSF and the other rail carriers are using Ukraine and COVID to blame the supply chain disruptions while they are basically stuffing cash into their pockets. This is what looting looks like. Jeff, do you have any final thoughts on Ryan's question there? Uh, yes, a couple. And uh, to correct Max, uh, mile-long trains are a pipe dream. The, the <laughs> trains right now are running three miles long or longer. And we could go into uh, uh, several shows about how dangerous that is, not only to the employees, but to the general public. But as far as Ryan's question about uh, are the, the rail carriers serious about hiring, this is, is my take on it. I, I just talked to a guy two days ago about this. Uh, he said that BNSF in, our, in, in the terminal in Fort Madison, Iowa, uh, has a class coming up. I believe it's either next week or the week after. They've got one person in that class. So you tell me how serious they are. Meanwhile, uh, from another thing I've been hearing, over 2,000 people have quit since uh, the advent of, of uh, high vids on, on the BNSF. And uh, we, we talked about the emotional and physical um, uh, parts of this. About a month, a month and a half ago, within a three week period, we had three people in this area die. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually, two people died on a locomotive, one from heart failure and another one uh, with a stroke. Another person committed suicide. A major contributing factor to that is the, the uh, high vis policy. So no, they're, they're not really serious. You know, I think what we really need is a former McKinsey consultant to take over the Department of Transportation and just figure all of this out for us. Surely his experience should help us put all of these pieces of the puzzle together. Max and he Jeff. He can do something. He could. Buttigieg, Buttigieg could actually win people over right now. I mean, I'm again, I'm, I'm the editor in chief of a nonprofit. I can't like advocate either way. But as Jeff and other rail workers have said, Je uh, Pete Buttigieg, this could be your moment. You could rise up and do something about this. Same with Secretary Marty Walsh. Like they can do something, but as of right now, they have not. They're too busy talking to the executives. Uh, so we'll, remains to be seen. Uh, thank you both, Max and Jeff, for your time and your insights. Thank you for covering this. Absolutely. We'll be back with more Rising after this.